It's Bill Olson and Free Speech Zone. Okay, I'm Bill Olson, and welcome to Free Speech Zone. Well, to start out, remember last week I told you about my grandmother in the Illuminati or whatever it was? The Order of the Eastern Star. I'm totally ignorant on what that is, except that it, the more I read about it, the more it looks like one of them conspiracy nuts wrote the, the story. Anyway, this little necklace is what I found, and there it is. So you can take a look at it. Take, take it off the CG for a second. There you go. Thanks. Yeah, now it's got a diamond right here. And it's got a mother of pearl thing right there. Now these, there's a different emblem in each point of the star. And each one stands for some virtue. And they're all backed up supposedly by the Bible. But when I looked this up on the internet, well this little necklace is like 400 bucks or something. But when I looked it up on the internet, it was, uh, they, you know, they, they said that uh, God-fearing Christians would never join. And then when you look up the the website for the what the uh, eastern the rising star the eastern star or whatever they call it, uh, it talks about how hard it is to get in and that they welcome all faiths any faith. And it doesn't I so if anybody knows about that contact me and let me know what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> and in the meantime, go ahead and poof we're back to free speech zone, and. One of my favorite people is Larry Pinkney. He's an ex-Black Panther. Well, he's still a Black Panther, but he's not one of the new Black Panthers that is really a government COINTEL pro op. Um, he was the information minister of the former Black Panthers, which did so much good for our society, and yet they were brutally repressed by the FBI and the CIA. Well, we're going to go to an infowars.com uh, clip here, and they're interviewing Larry Pinkney, and they're one of the only shows that does that. I don't really understand why, uh, because Larry Pinkney is one of the right on, right on people. So go ahead and play this. This is about a half hour, so sit back and enjoy. This is a good one. This is a protest, and this is a riot. If you can't tell the difference, then you are part of the problem. Infowars.com. We've got a special guest, and he's a very dangerous man. This is someone that you speak to on a on a weekly basis, maybe. Yeah, yeah we're good good friends. friends. Yeah. So go ahead and introduce our guest. Well, the reason why I say he's a dangerous man, I, and I personally don't think he's dangerous, but the federal government certainly does. And that's because of his ability to unite people of all color. And uh, we've even got proof from his official FBI profile that says he's dangerous for that reason. And of course, I'm talking about Larry Pinkney, and he is a member of the original Black Panther Party, also a victim of COINTELPRO, a political prisoner for 10 plus years. And he joins us now from the land of Mordor. And Marcos, I'll read that in a second, but first let's get Larry on. Larry, welcome to the InfoWars Money Bomb. It's good to have you. Brother, this is fantastic. Uh, and I want to also extend my kudos to, to uh, Brother Joe sitting there with you. Uh, but what can I say? Let's rock and roll. That's well, it. I'm ready to rock and roll, too. But before we get started, I want to read the uh, FBI profile they have on you. And this is, we obtained this from the Freedom of Information Act. This is what it says about our guest, Larry Pinkney. Pinkney is potentially dangerous due to his demonstrated ability to unify black and white his associates are Negro, white, and Chinese. Special attention is being given to neutralizing him, <clears throat> COINTELPRO. The areas of sex and drugs appear to be the most effective ones to utilize. His habits in this area are unknown, but are being monitored with this objective. Wow. So uh, that, that shows you are a very dangerous uh, man. Now, this was back during the Civil Rights Movement, but Larry... The more things change, the more they stay the same. That's right. That's absolutely correct. And what we really need to understand is, well, I like it. You summed it up, Darren. 
You know, my brother, you said it. The more things change, the more they stay the same if we allow them to be that way. And the reality is COINTELPRO never died. The counterintelligence program never died. It still goes on, whether it's under NDAA, the Patriot Act, whatever you want, whatever name someone wants to put on it. The reality is that, in fact, in this 21st century, in the year 2015, it is far worse, I repeat, far worse than ever before. Uh, and and we, I'm not saying this to make anybody paranoid. No, this is not about being paranoid. Just be aware. You know, stop going for the ghost. Let's understand that this is not a government of, by, and for the people. This is a government of, by, and for the global elite and the corporations. That's right. All right? So I just had to inject that. Well, that's right, and they, they, the government does not want to unite us. They want to divide us, and this is something that... Well, you can see that with, the, with this whole Black Lives Matter thing. All it's done is divided the people here in America. You know, when I speak to a lot of my, uh, a lot of my friends, we would sit there and go, I didn't even know there was racism between, you know, you and I. Now I have to specify, oh, uh, my, my black friend or, you know, my white friend. It used to just be, hey, my buddy, you know, uh, Apollo... Yeah. Uh, Apollo is one of my great friends that I grew up with. Uh, we DJ together in clubs, and now we have to specify stuff. And then if you bring up the, you know, the white, the black, then you're racist. So there's really this huge division, and the Obama administration's definitely been behind that. They haven't denied it in any kind of way, and they're pushing this racist agenda forward. And I, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the bottom line is this. How can black lives matter if all lives don't matter. Oh, man. I mean, let's be honest. Stop shucking and jiving. <laughs> How can black lives matter if all lives don't matter? Okay? The lives of my black, white, brown, red, and yellow brothers and sisters all matter. The name of the game is to divide, to control, to manipulate. So, and let's remember... Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the so-called leadership of Black Lives Matter sat down with who? Hillary the Butcher Clinton. Come on, let's get real. And we need to understand that we everyday ordinary black, white, brown, red, and yellow people, we are the only ones together, collectively, who are going to bring about effective systemic change. Only us. Not We need to get off the plantation. That's right, I said plantation. We need to get off the plantation because that's where the Democrats and the Republicans have us. They have us on the plantation. It's time, as Thomas Jefferson said, for a revolution. He said, to quote him, every generation needs a new revolution. That's right. We are long overdue. Well, I've always been interested in the fact how the Democrat Party is the one who essentially holds African-Americans down in a sense, essentially tries to screw them over more than anybody else. And yet they kind of get suckered into continuously voting for that same thing. It's, it's like invisible, invisible handcuffs in a sense. The fact that they keep going in that direction. I mean, what do you think about that, Larry? Well... Let me put it this way, Joe, that my brother is that uh, it's all about taking, and I'm going to be, I'm going to address this directly. The Democratic Party, Malcolm X referred to the Democrats as the foxes and the Republicans as the wolves. Now, who's more dangerous? Well, the fox is pretty dangerous, perhaps even more so, because one does not recognize, that's why it's called a fox. You know, it's like going in the hen house, mm -hmm. the hens have all been eaten and asking the fox who ate the chickens, right? And the fox rubs his stomach and says, mm, I don't know, as he licks his lips. That's the Democratic Party, the so-called Party of Democrats. And, and we need to understand that. Uh, black Americans have been bamboozled 
again, to use an expression from Brother Malcolm, for years and years and years, decades and decades. This, this drone man, Mr. Hope and Change, Barack Obama, was their latest missile, if you will. Look at what he's done. I'll tell you what he's done. The conditions economically for black people, and quite frankly, people of all colors, but let's deal with black people right now, are worse now than virtually any time in, the, the, in, in this century, actually. Not virtually. This is the 21st century. I mean, we need to be honest. We are in a situation, all of us, black, white, brown, red, and yellow, where we have to be honest, first with ourselves and then with each other. So what I think about it, Joe, is that uh, it's time to get, I, I'll go back to what I said before, it is time to get off, get the hell off the plantation. That's right. All of us, black, white, brown, red, yellow folks, they keep us on the plantation. And the Democrats, in particular, are famous for that. I, I think that, uh, um, you know, my brother Darren and I have talked a little bit about Lyndon Johnson and what Lyndon Johnson had to say. Darren, you might want to elaborate on that. I don't know. Well, Lyndon Johnson was infam infamously known for saying that he'll have those N-words voting Democrat for the next, what, 100 years, I think was the quote? Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, we need to understand that as long as we uh, allow ourselves to be duped, and that's what we're doing, we allow ourselves to be duped. When I wrote years and years ago, and I tried to warn people about this Barack Obama creature, they said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. He's black. <laughs> That's what they said, right? And I said, you don't understand because you're acting like a damn fool. You need to pay attention to what a person is about. As Dr. King said, it's about character, not color. It's about character not color. So, you we know, have that we happening are. all over again right now. We have that same That's thing right. happening now with Hillary Clinton. You have these feminists, you have these women coming out and going, well, just because she's a female, they're going to vote for and completely ignore all the horrible things she's done. Like you said, you called her the butcher earlier. She is a pretty much, I think, one of the most evil human beings out there. But people are going to look past that. And the fact that she's a woman, we just had the first black president. Now we have to move to have the first woman president so we can progress on and it completely ignore who she is as a person, which is what we should be paying attention to, not what she looks like, not what genitalia she has, but who she is, her character, or lack thereof. That's right. That's right. And and the fact is that irrespective of, of her, I like the way you put that genitalia, <laughs> irrespective of, of, of what her gender may be, the reality is, is that she's bloody Mary all over again. That's why I refer to her deliberately as Hillary the Butcher Clinton, because she's a butcher. And let's understand that. How do you, what, because she's a woman, she's going to bomb people lovingly? She's going to kill people gently? Dead is dead. Let's be real. And, and you know, Albert Einstein, I believe it was, said, I believe this quote, and I'm paraphrasing it, but he indicated that when we people, everyday people, when we people constantly repeat the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result, that's insanity. That is insane. That is absolute madness. It is time for we the people black, white, brown, red, and yellow people in this country to wake the heck up and understand that we need a real change. Get off the plantation. Democrat, Republican, get off the plantation. So do you think that racism is more prevalent now 
or was it then back when you joined the Black Panther Party? Or does it seem like there's more racism now due to the fact of social media, the fact that everybody can share videos and the mainstream media uses that to help anger people? Because for some reason we have this youth who have this sense of sense of entitlement, so to say, that they feel like they're they should be given everything and not work hard and try to ignore stupid petty things. They just want to be given things. I've talked to a lot of my friends who, you know, are, are older black guys, and they tell me, like, they'll say, hey, the fact that you and I are sitting at a bar right now having a drink and no one's bothering us shows you that we progress in the U.S. He says the fact that when I was a younger guy, I wouldn't be able to do something like that shows that we have progressed. But for some reason, you have this young, angry group now that really I just don't get I. I've grown up around people of every color, and I, I've never really had... Oh, it, it seems like there's a resurgence of, of racism right now, and I think that's because uh, a lot of people are being programmed and, and they're being pushed into believing or, or becoming racist through groups like the Black Lives Matter. Or, Larry, tell us about the difference between the original Black Panther Party and the agent provocateur new Black Panthers, who I, who I think they're nothing more than agent provocateurs who are meant to destabilize the nation, and they're basically out there to, to uh, you know, basically get everybody angry at each other and divide and conquer. Well, the so-called new Black Panthers, and you notice I said so-called. Yeah. First of all, uh, there's no such thing as the New Black Panthers. They are, in the words of uh, uh, another veteran of the original Black Panther Party, Albert Howard, they are thugs and reactionaries. Now, why are they allowed to uh, get away with this? Well, I mean, common sense tells us that, when I say this, by the way, why are they allowed to engage in uh, inciting and provocative actions that are negatively provocative. It's one thing to be provocative in a positive way. But these folks are all about how can we, uh, you know, move against whitey, you dig? Yeah. And this is unacceptable. The uh, uh, veterans of the original Black Panther Party we see this, we know what they're about, and I think people outside of that realm see it and know what they're about. Uh, but we have to ask ourselves, why is this being allowed? Who's behind this? How, why is this being allowed? You don't see any kind of, <laughs> excuse me, serious repression coming down upon them. Well, why not? Because they don't have any programs uh, national programs, national breakfast programs to serve the people, national medical programs to serve the people, national uh, programs, health care programs, etc., clothing programs to serve the people. No, because that's not their aim. And that was the, to serve the people of, of all color, right, Larry? People I mean, of all color. Right. Yep. <laughs> and I, excuse me for coughing here, but I get a little bit intense about this. Because I see this happening again and again, and I see folks like them coming along and whipping up hysteria. Look, let me be clear. Of course there's racism in the United States. Hell, there's racism all over the world. Exactly. Okay? Uh, but let us not sit back and pretend, and Joe, I think earlier you had said something I wanted to address very quickly, and that is, you see, young people, including black young people, do not study their history. They act like history be, be gone when their posteriors were born. Well, I'm sorry, that's not when history began. And when it comes to Racism, which is real, okay, but when it comes to racism, let us understand that the struggle against racism has been waged for years and years and years, not only by black people, but by white folks, brown folks, yellow folks. And I, one of my heroes, if you will, is John Brown. 
and his three sons who were hung at Harper's Ferry. And John Brown said very clearly, he said, I didn't do this simply uh, this slave rebellion. I didn't join this. And he was a white man, for any who don't know that. Okay, this slave rebellion, I didn't join this, <coughs> excuse me, simply for uh, uh, black folks. I did it for my own humanity, you dig? And that's what I keep trying to stress to my brothers and sisters, my sisters and brothers of all colors. We got to do this for our own humanity. Let's not get hoodwinked, bamboozled, and sidetracked by these opportunists, agent provocateurs, no matter what they call themselves, reactionaries, okay? We have to understand that what is at stake in this land, in this nation, indeed throughout Mother Earth, but in this land is for all of us. It's all of us together as a collective people or none of us. That's right. All right, we're going to take some calls in just a second. But before we do that, I want to talk about some of the Money Bomb 2015 specials we have going on right now at InfoWars Life. Currently, we have 20% off Survival Shield X2, 20% off of Super Metal Vitality, 20% off of Brain Force, 15% off Deep Cleanse, 15% off Seeker 12, and last but not least, 15% off Oxy Powder. Now, this will be, we'll have free shipping for the continuation of this money bomb. Remember, all this goes to help get us to that 400 million that we want to reach. We're trying to reach a million dollars for that to help pay for the satellite costs and all that. So, Larry, how do you feel about taking a few uh, phone calls? I think it's wonderful. But before I do, okay, I, I want to say to my sisters and brothers, my brothers and sisters out there in the listening audience, you know what? This is urgent. Understand, this is urgent. InfoWars means just what it says. It's about information, not propaganda in the negative sense of the word, but it's about information waking up. So by supporting, and by the way, nobody asked me to say this. Darren and Joe had no idea I was going to say what I'm saying right now. All right. But by supporting InfoWars, you know what you're really doing? You're supporting yourself. You're supporting the people. You're supporting what Thomas Jefferson and Malcolm X talked about as the much needed revolution in this country. That's all I have to say. Uh, Janine in Minnesota, are you there? Yes, I am. There Would you is. like to ask a question to Larry Pinckney? I had a comment for Mr. Pinckney, and I had a comment for Darren. All right. Well, let's go ahead and hear him. Okay. Mr. Pinckney, thank you for saying what you did. I am so tired of a two-way street racism fight, and I appreciate what you say so much. I grew up near an Air Force base, and I've always had black friends. I see no color difference. People are people. We all bleed red. And Darren... I have been using your Bush ad that I, f I burst out laughing every time I see it. <laughs> I know exactly which one you're talking about. Maybe, oh maybe we can God. play it after the next break. I actually <laughs> recorded it on my camera because I waited for the nightly news to come around the next hour so right. I knew where it was. And I've been sending that to everybody I know and then say, go check out Infowars.com. Now, is it okay if I put that video on Facebook? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That, that helps get that the word out even best. more. You know, those oh, are a lot goodness. of fun. We, we call those quick clips. Okay, well, I came back from that one because I didn't realize that it had so many direct advertisements in it. and We're not supposed to have any on cable access, so I had to get rid of it. Uh, I hope that's mitigating circumstances well enough. Uh, but right now, we've got a short clip from Lionel Nation. That's the, you know, there are a lot of people that just are known by one name, Lionel. Okay, well, he was a former uh, 
prosecutor and a, and also a media analyst, so he's he can come at issues from two different angles. And let's listen to him talk about about our political system. My friends, everything is a work. This is a professional wrestling term that I've talked about forever, which denotes an angle, the scam, the story, the the BS, the you know, the official, he's an undertaker, he's satanic, it's a work. He, um, you know, lost the title, it's a work, it's all a work. Show business, show business, that's politics, it's all a work. Now, the other day, I can't believe sometimes how, how incredibly naive people are. When Joe Biden was on Colbert, I said, you know, I just don't have it in me, I really don't have that fight. I really, I thought, this guy is phenomenal. What a work. Now, anytime somebody loses a child, give them a pass, okay? But don't be surprised if through tragedy, the work is helped along. The son who says, whatever you do, dad, fight. Fight. Continue the fight, Dad. Now, Dr. Jill, what's his name? Joe Herb, Jill Biden, whatever, Dr. The, the wife. I'm for Joe. Can't you see this? And the other day, when, when he was on Colbert, people said, no, no, you don't understand. He said he doesn't have the fight. I said, it's a work. What are you talking about? Hillary is imploding. Don't you understand what's happening? I have a dear friend of mine who was such a, a blind Democrat, liberal, progressive, I don't know, a Hillary fan, he doesn't understand she's toast. I've been telling you this. They're holding back. Don't you understand? They're not showing their hand. They're not shooting their wad yet. They're waiting. Why don't you think anybody in the Republican uh, scrum has mentioned her at all. They're waiting. Do you have any idea the stuff they've got? Do you have any idea? Not only that, it's she's not connecting. This is not a personal... I don't know Hillary at all. She might be a great person. Look, I've met people uh, throughout my life. People that are famous, not famous. And when you meet them... You think, God, they're great. And then it's other people you think who are famous, they're dull. I don't care about personality. You do know that, right? You do know that I don't care. I don't care if they're nice or if they have tangles or if their hair is weird. I don't care about that. Too much of our politics is that way. I hear these things about Trump. Trump is a, a disgusting. He's a xenophobic. He's a racist. He's a vile. No, he's not. What are you talking about? That Carson doesn't believe that a Muslim. Oh, stop it. Then you got the Republicans saying that Obama is a Muslim and he's a communist. No, he's not. This is ridiculous. This is a work. Don't you understand what's happening right now? Joe Biden sitting back at the height or heights, as people say, of the, of the Democratic echelons, they're saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Hillary is toast. They're just sitting back waiting. So they bring in the machine. Joe Biden is a machine. He can do it. And remember, no matter who becomes president, once you're there, they hand you the script to the play. No matter what you think about Hamlet, it's already written. All we do is get a different actor. And Bernie Sanders. It's terrific what Bernie Sanders is saying. It's terrific. But we need specifics. Bernie, we understand income redistribution. What are you going to do about it? What? Be specific. And I'm talking to friends about you. Well, he's being specific. No, he's not. This is platitudes. This is bumper sticker stuff. And by the way... Grow a pair, Bernie, and back off, backing up this 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 tyrannical, this 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 ridiculous, corrupt, monarchical Saudi Arabia. It's all a work. Don't you understand what this is? It's it, it's all nonsense. 
And the people who yell the loudest know the least. Now you're always going to ask me, well, whom are you supporting? Nobody. Every year I write, I'm going to write in my own name. Nobody is even, even approximating. Bernie Sanders is the only person who is at least talking about the subject matter that I wish he had a plan for. He's talking about something that I wish he knew how to implement. You know what I mean? It's like having a doctor who says, I want to cure you. How? I don't know. I'm a dentist. Okay? Fine. Follow me on Twitter at Lionel Media. Sign up for my podcast at LionelMedia.com and comment as you see fit. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, sage advice. Just sit back and watch it happen. It's a work in progress. In other words, they're playing it. They're playing you, they're playing me, they're playing a game. And, uh, okay, a new subject, or an old subject, depending on how you look at it. Remember breaking the set with Abby Martin? She was a wonderful young woman who asked all the right questions. She had the right attitudes. She cared about people. She cares about events. She cares about the truth. She cares about, you know, <laughs> rules and things like that that, you know, I'm talking in particular about the Bill of Rights, things like that. I'm not talking about keep off the grass type of rules. But anyway, remember, all of a sudden, without any real ceremony or explanation, breaking the set was over, and Abby Martin was gone off the picture, and, and no amount of Googling things would find out anything more than, you know, she gave the typical farewell speech and, you know, wish everybody well and uh, I'm off to build my career, goodbye. And what? What does that mean? Was she forced out or, or wasn't she? I don't know. Well, anyway, she moved over to uh, uh, another reputable uh, news group in RT, it's, uh, or I mean in uh, <laughs> the Real News Network. So she's working with those guys. I believe they're out of Boston, but I'm not sure. And uh, she started a whole new show, and we're going to go ahead and play it right now. It's a, this is a 25-minute one. This is 9-11 uh, and Empire. Her show's about Empire. So let's go ahead and watch. Nine Eleven forever defined our generation, and ever since, the U.S. government has waged a new kind of global warfare against the ubiquitous threat of terrorism. The gaping hole at Ground Zero, left for five years, served as a perpetual reminder of this new and dark era. Finally, a memorial was constructed, a gift shop erected, and a shiny freedom tower built to immortalize the values Americans were told they were attacked for. But families still languish for closure as their loved ones' remains were discarded into a New York City landfill. More than 4,000 human remains were dumped, yet only 300 people ever identified. And the 9-11 heroes used as props for empire were left in the dust, waiting to die in silence. Because of sanctioned EPA lies that the pulverized concrete and asbestos dust cloud was safe to breathe, an estimated 1,300 emergency responders who helped with the cleanup have died from 9-11 related illness so far. More than three times the amount killed that day. Thousands more are dying. Yet the same government that rushed to exploit their sacrifice denied them health care up until 2012, when it was forced to acknowledge the 20% rise in cancer bore direct correlation to ground zero toxicity. The nation was traumatized and re-traumatized by 24-7 corporate war propaganda. And the government seized on a nation in fear to leap to war with no clear enemy or end. 
With its rabid group of extremist neocons at the helm, the Empire set out to capture a swath of new spoils it had longed to dominate. Guns blazing, they could barely contain their excitement over all the new markets previously out of reach. We've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just... He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. We were told the only way to prevent another terrorist attack on U.S. soil was to invade and occupy Afghanistan, conveniently located in an extremely profitable region once out of reach to U.S. business, like the natural gas-rich former Soviet republics of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, and at a crossroads for trade for U.S. business competitors Russia, China, and India. They trumpeted the heroism of saving Afghanistan from a dark, feudal past, a new future where women could be free and democracy could replace extremism. Vampire's leaders often don't expect us to take a simple look at history. There was one time in Afghanistan's past where women's rights were advancing and codified into law, where literacy programs for girls and impoverished people were on the rise. This Afghanistan was one the empire paid billions of dollars to destroy. In the 70s, the social progress coming from Kabul angered Afghanistan's feudal lords and ultra-conservative religious groups. Forming the Mujahideen, they attacked women's schools and carried out a reign of terror. But the empire felt it had more in common with the Mujahideen than the new government and started pumping millions of dollars in cash, advanced weapons and training into these groups, sponsoring the ongoing atrocities. Excited that the Soviet Union sent its military to support the government, the CIA dumped even more money to fund the Mujahideen. The group even received a grand welcome at the White House. Journalist and author Ahmed Rashid writes about the effect of this U.S. operation. Some 35,000 Muslim radicals from 40 Islamic countries joined Afghanistan's fight between 1982 and 1992. Afghan people don't have a history of being religious zealots. To create the CIA desired jihad required the recruitment of Arab, Egyptian and Pakistani extremists. So the fundamentalism that emerged in Afghanistan is a CIA construct. So what groups had their formative years here on the U.S. taxpayer's dime? Oh, just Osama bin Laden and his network and the people who became the Taliban, eventually seizing power in 1996. The Clinton administration engaged with and cooperated with the Taliban almost immediately afterward to ensure oil giant Unical's proposed pipelines flowed freely. But with a new opportunity to plant bases in one of the most resource-rich regions of the world, an invasion was launched. The stated goal wasn't ever to capture bin Laden, but rather to destroy al-Qaeda and Taliban training camps in the country. We haven't uh, captured any al-Qaeda, but... And, and how many have you actually managed to kill here in southeast Afghanistan? We haven't killed any. At the outset, the Pentagon's generals were brimming with arrogance about their easy conquest. But occupying a country where 92% have never even heard of what, quote, foreigners call 9-11 didn't prove so simple. And as contempt and resistance to the occupation spread, the war became a military disaster. Casualties for U.S. service members surged. From 2009 to 2010, U.S. troops requiring limb amputations increased 60%, with a 90% increase in severe wounds to their genitalia. So generals and politicians did the only thing they know how to do, lie about the reality and order more slaughter. Hear it from their own mouths. 
commander of British forces from 2007 to 2008, said the Afghanistan war is neither feasible nor supportable. The American strategy is doomed to fail. Atreus, commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan from 2010 to 2011, said, you have to recognize that I don't think you win this war. This is the kind of fight we're in for the rest of our lives and probably our kids' lives. And Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, who interviewed hundreds of soldiers touring Afghanistan on two separate tours, said, when you're given a mission that cannot succeed, what is the purpose of the mission? How many more men must die behind an array of optimistic statements by U.S. senior leaders in Afghanistan? Like with Vietnam, when the commanders knew they couldn't win, they wanted to make sure to preserve the face of this invincible empire by retreating in slow motion, leaving a trail of bombs and limbs behind them. In 2012, Staff Sergeant Matthew Sitton, on his third tour to Afghanistan, wrote to his congressman, I'm only writing this email because I feel myself and my soldiers are being put into unnecessary positions where harm and danger are imminent. There is no end state or purpose for the patrols given to us from our higher chain of command, only that we will be out for a certain period of time. As a brigade, we are averaging at a minimum an amputee a day from our soldiers because we're walking around aimlessly through grape rows and compounds that are littered with explosives. I'm concerned about the well-being of my soldiers and have tried to voice my opinion through the proper channels of my own chain of command, only to be turned away and told that I need to stop complaining. Thank you again for allowing soldiers to voice their opinion. If anything, Please pray for us. God bless. Very respectfully, SSG Matthew Sitton. He was killed just weeks later, leaving behind a wife and newborn child. To date, 2,355 soldiers have died. An estimated 20,000 have been maimed. What utter contempt for the lives of service members from the people who say most avidly that they support the troops. Now that the end of this slow retreat has come, paved with the lives of at least 26,000 Afghans, the U.S. plans to maintain massive bases there, occupied by 10,000 troops until at least 2024. Afghanistan's new government is far from the bright and democratic future the U.S. promised, but a wildly corrupt one run by warlords, passing laws as repressive as the Taliban. A staggering 90% of the world's opium now comes from Afghanistan after being nearly eradicated pre-2001. Planning to never leave, officials can only hope that the public doesn't notice the war still churns on, pointlessly throwing more lives away. Now the country's longest war, costing taxpayers a shocking $2 billion a week, Afghanistan was just a stepping stone in the post-9-11 offensive. By late 2002, the empire was already beating the drums for a new war to protect American lives. Dubbed Operation Iraqi Freedom, it was the violent culmination of a policy of aggression spanning both Democratic and Republican administrations. U.S. Attorney General under President Johnson, Ramsey Clark, documented the effects of U.S. bombing and sanctions on Iraq through the 90s. One of the great uh, human disasters of history. <laughs> Life's never been the same again. For most of these years, most of the people there have had no sense of security. But the house may blow up at any moment, you know, that sort of problem. And um, far from no progress, um, hard to stay alive, hard to raise children, hard to get enough food, and constant care about water because <clears throat> the most of the supply has been polluted. So it's been a hell on earth since January of 1991. What were the targets of that bombing campaign? It was uh, obviously to destroy um, major life support systems, um, 
to, to tear the country down to where just living was hard. And um, to keep it from coming back. Of course, following the bombing campaign was the sanctions that were employed in Iraq. Ramsey, you, as well as a team of investigators, documented extensively what effects these sanctions had. What were the major findings? The intensity of the bombing and the defenseless country, the uh, sheer tonnage of explosive destruction uh, per capita for that period of time, probably unprecedented in, in history, even the massive bombing in World War II. And um, no real chance for revival. There's been no significant revival. It's been a life of hanging on hoping for someday, somewhere over the rainbow, um, peace and happiness uh, can come again. The, uh, the cruelty of it in the daily lives of the people over all of these years now um, it would be hard to uh, find an equal to in history. It's different because it was a well-developed country and had a good standard of living. But for the people who, after the Iran-Iraq war, for several years between that and what we call the Gulf War, um, there's been, in terms of where they were and, and where they became to be and remain to this day, there's probably um, suffering of society of that level of cultivation uh, systematically maintained <laughs> the suffering, unprecedented in history. That includes a lot of devastation and death. The country was already decimated, bombed from 1991, yet these sanctions employed took the lives of half a million babies. Why? Why were these sanctions instilled and what damage did those do? Well, infant mortality, beginning in, in late January, skyrocketed. But um, they ran out of uh, infant formula within weeks. I mean, bad water will take a baby out like that, you know. I mean, it's, old folks like me can, our insides have been toughened, you know. We've, we've had a lot of bad water over the years. <laughs> but uh, babies, uh, they can go in a couple of hours from bad water. Like with Afghanistan, the arrogant captains of empire thought their new military adventure would be easy. But there was massive, widespread opposition to the American occupation throughout Iraqi society. A common theme when countries are bombed, invaded, occupied, and subjugated by a foreign army. When a military disaster was clear in the face of a population that would not accept foreign occupation, the Empire lied some more, dropped more bombs, and sent more to die. By the time the Empire was forced to retreat from Iraq, 4,486 U.S. servicemen and women had died, and 31,951 left maimed. But for the Iraqi people, the toll was far, far worse. In a country of only 25 million, one million Iraqis were killed. 800,000 children left orphaned. One in five either killed, wounded, or displaced. And staggering cancer rates from the military's use of banned, radioactive, depleted uranium. 
And what of Iraq's bright democratic future delivered by the U.S. invasion? The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS. Dahlia Wasfi, Iraqi-American writer and activist, discusses how Iraq got to this point. From the time that the United States showed up, uh, and with collaboration from UN administrators, there was an effort to divide the country, establishing uh, an initial Iraqi governing council, 25-member group that were handpicked by American administrators with consultation from UN administrators. And there was a specific number, they decided a specific number of Shia leaders, specific number of Sunni leaders and specific number of Kurds. And then I think uh, one Turkmen representing the Turk Turkmen minority in Iraq. But this was historically foreign to, to Iraqi society. So that was the beginning of it. Um, and then came the sectarian death squads, which has really caused the separation of the Sunni and Shia communities of Islam, not only in Iraq, but that has now spread throughout the region. I wanted you to just expand a little bit more on the death squads and, and really how oppressive his regime is and how corrupt it is. This has been such a contributing factor to the emergence of ISIS that has that has done brought more brutality to Iraq than ISIS if only because they've had more time since showing up since being uh, you know elected in 2005. Uh, this is the brutality of the death squads that the people have feared and have been demonstrating against uh, since 2011. Uh, and those demonstrations, uh, comparably, they, they're referred to as part of the Arab Spring, but those demonstrations brutally crushed by the Iraqi government that we're closely tied to. And this is standard for U.S. operating procedure in countries where we install ruthless dictators and uh, to the ex at the expense of the people. And this is, we did the same thing when we helped bring Saddam Hussein to power, and, and we've done it once again, and once again embracing people who are committing atrocities. And how strong was Iraqi unity and national identity then compared to now? They divided Baghdad in particular into a Sunni neighborhood, a, a Shia neighborhood, even a Christian neighborhood. It was divided along uh, 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 ethnic and, uh, and or excuse me, sectarian lines, and that was just not that was that did not exist in Iraq prior to 2003. Given how many times the U.S. has intervened specifically in Iraq. And then you have people today saying, what are we supposed to do? Look at ISIS, look at how brutal they are. I mean, what is your response to those people who continue to invoke military action as some sort of solution to the problems in Iraq today? We're pouring gasoline on the fire by continuing to pour arms and monies into the region and uh, to forces who are destabilizing. Um, there is nothing that the U.S. military, they, they're not trained in stabilization. Um, they're, they're trained to pave the way for, uh, to use military might to pave the way for business. This is not about going in to save the day, but that's the major obstacle, is the notion that the U.S. military is a force of good. It's, it's such a powerful myth in this country, and, uh, and unfortunately it still holds today. But every day that passes, we're talking about innocent men, women, and children who are, who are paying the ultimate price for suffering from bombs overhead, from the brutality of an American-backed uh, theocratic dictatorship now instead of a secular one, and from the ruthlessness of, uh, of uh, ISIS. With the rise of ISIS clearly resulting from the U.S. war on Iraq, what has been the empire's response? As if the past two decades didn't happen at all, bombing and sending more troops. But with the empire at the helm once again, only death and chaos can lay in its wake. And already the return of bombs, mostly dropped by the United States, has already stripped the lives of countless innocent people. Air Wars, a team of journalists tracking coalition strikes on ISIS in Iraq and Syria, estimates upwards of 1,500 civilian deaths, despite the Pentagon admitting to only two. Beyond Iraq, though, U.S. intervention in Libya and Syria gave ISIS the space to really gain strength. Well, I, uh, I doubt if ISIS would have come into existence except for U.S. policy. And our foreign policy is not based upon um, human welfare. It's based on uh, military and economic uh, 
alliances, economic um, dominating the military's subsidiary to protection of the economic interests. Is there a military solution to ISIS, Ramsey, from the West? I think, uh, I think immediate uh, peace with the government in, in uh, Damascus is, is essential to the well-being of the uh, region. And I think if we don't do it, the only reason is that we want to make uh, Syria another Iraq, simply a crushed country for a generation or two, you know, while we can try to learn how to profit from whatever emerges from the ruins. Invasions aside, the war on terror released flocks of flying executioners, with a Nobel Peace Prize winning drone king overseeing a kill list and the bombing of seven countries total, including Somalia, Yemen, and Pakistan. Death taunts children from the sky and thousands of people assassinated without due process. Our so-called leaders want the legacy of 9-11 to invoke fear of the rise of Islamic terrorism. But if we just look at reality, it's the very actions by the U.S. Empire that's unleashed this threat to people around the world. From sanctions to invasions, this file lays bare that the biggest terrorist organization in the world today is the U.S. Empire. See, while the establishment incessantly fearmongers the American public about the growing threat of ISIS while displaying their YouTube propaganda apparatus, U.S. Central Command has its own death porn channel video logging their beheadings by drone. A drop in the bucket of the crimes and chaos the empire has showered on this region of the world. But amidst its success in completely shredding several countries, it's also revealed a weakness that its greed and arrogance can lead it to disaster. And any crisis for the empire means new opportunities for the people to expose its lies, its crimes, and to mobilize against it. Okay, I, I'm glad that she uh, did that show. That was really great. But she missed a good one when she was talking about Operation Iraqi Freedom. Well, it was originally called Operation Iraqi Liberation. But it was too cynical even for our people. O-I-L, oil? Oh, well. Anyway, and about the Nobel Peace Prize, the top executive of the Nobel uh, Committee says that they regret giving it to Obama. How about that? <laughs>